Okay, everybody, it looks like we are live on Facebook. So that is streaming all nicely. So if you're joining us on Facebook, hello, we'll get started in a couple of minutes. Uh, thanks for joining us today. All right, I'm gonna admit people from the waiting room. Thanks everyone for joining us today for our BD at Home, Pressing Plants Part 2. We'll be getting started in just a couple of minutes. Um, this session is being recorded and streamed to YouTube, just letting you know. Um, and yeah, uh, let us know where you're joining us from. You can type that in the chat. Um, and once again, thanks for joining us. We'll be getting started in a minute. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for joining us for our BD at Home Pressing Plants Part 2. So our live stream here is streaming to uh, Facebook and YouTube, and we'll be recording uh, this. But um, So uh, you can leave your camera on or off at your discretion. Uh, just letting you know, we also have our automatic transcription on. So at the bottom of the screen, there is the CC button. So if you find the captions distracting, you can turn them off. This will only do it on your end, so don't worry about that. Um, and once again, thank you for joining us for our BD at Home. This is Pressing Plants Part 2. So we are being led by Linda Jennings and Julia Allards Tomalin. Linda is our UBC Collections Curator of Vascular Plants and Algae of our herbarium, so our plant collection. Um, and Julia is joining us as the Renewable Resources Instructor at BCIT. Myself, Vincent, I'm a museum interpreter here at the BD Museum, and I'll be trying to help answer any questions in the chat. So yes, if you have any questions, things like that, you can type that into the chat box and we will uh, try to get to those. So where is the BD Museum? So the BD Museum is located on the ancestral, unceded, and traditional territory of the Musqueam people. Uh, this here is a flag that was raised at the UBC campus in Vancouver of the Musqueam flag. You can see a very important part of the Musqueam people's life of the biodiversity here in BC. We see a salmon. Um, you can see the website there um, if you want to learn more about this flag raising and more about the Musqueam people. On a map, you will see the BD Biodiversity Museum um, on the University of BC campus uh, right smack in the middle of the campus. We are open uh, right now. So, um, so if you feel comfortable coming to visit us in person, uh, we welcome you. We're open 10 to 5, uh, Tuesday to Sunday. You'll see this if you're walking along UBC campus. 
Uh, you can see the big glass building on the ground level, there is that big skeleton. Um, behind the building, uh, you'll kind of see through the glass there, is the Biodiversity Research Center, um, where curators, professors, researchers, postgrad doc, um, postdoctoral researchers, uh, folks like Linda, of course, are working there on all kinds of biodiversity research from ecology to genetics and everything in between. There's the big blue whale skeleton, um, kind of gets the most attention, but it's one of 2 million plus specimens housed in our collections, um, all telling amazing stories about biodiversity. So I keep mentioning the collections, um, and just like any proper library has some level of organization, uh, we've organized into six different collections. Um, we have our tetrapod collection represented by the brown feather. Uh, these are four limbed vertebrates and their descendants. So mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, you find them in there. We have a marine invertebrate collection represented by the yellow shell. This is a very diverse collection filled with all kinds of animals with no backbone that live in the ocean. It covers a lot of different kinds of animals, a very diverse group of animals. Then we have the most diverse collection of all, the herbarium. Um, of course, this is where we'll be focusing our attentions today. Um, the herbarium, of course, um, houses our plant collection. So that's vascular plants, also non-vascular plants, also um, algae, also fungi, which aren't plants, but historically they've been grouped with them. So you will find them in a herbarium. So again, this includes multiple kingdoms of life, the most diverse of our collections. Then we have the purple butterfly representing our entomology collection. So these are insects and other land arthropods. So they're relatives like spiders. Uh, then we have the fish collection with the blue fish. Um, these are all the vertebrates with fins and gills. And then we have our fossil collection joints with the Pacific Museum of the Earth, um, seeing as they are specimens of living things from Earth's past, but they are also geological specimens. Uh, so here you'll find things like dinosaur fossils, fossils of invertebrates from the Burgess Shale, um, and other amazing fossils of plants, animals, and others. Very diverse collection, um, as covered, it's split up in different collections, all kinds of things. Uh, you can see uh, in near the middle there, uh, we have some of our pressed plants, which we're going to be getting into more today. So these are, of course, our, our biodiversity collections. But today we're going to be looking at how we might make some of these specimens or prepare some of these specimens. Um, so I'm going to pass the time over to Linda and Julia uh, for our pressing plants part two. All righty. So I'm Linda Jennings. Thank you so much, Vincent, for the introduction. Um, do you want to say hello, Julia? Yes. Um, oh, I think I'm unmuted now. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Julia Allard's Tomlin. Really excited to be here today with you and, and uh, really excited to work with you on this, um, Linda. Yay. Me too. So um, Julia contacted me earlier this year to do a virtual. Um, oh, sorry, it's asking me something. Sorry, Zoom's asking me to do something. Oh, sorry, I think I might have clicked on your video, so you can just re-enable your video. Ah, that's why. There we go. My bad. There we go. <laughs> Hello again. So, um, yeah, so Julia contacted me from BCIT, and we did a virtual tour, and it got me thinking how cool it is to press plants. And I had already done a Beatty at Home 1.0 last May, and I wanted to continue that because I get a lot of questions about difficult specimens. So. We all like to press pretty little flowers, but sometimes things don't behave like pretty little flowers, such as things like this, which is not a pretty little flower. It's very tough and it's very difficult. So that's kind of what we're gonna go over today. So we're gonna start off and I'm gonna press a few things and talk about how I kind of deal with the press and how I deal with getting things flat. And then uh, Julia is then going to also press a few things and talk about particular things such as berries and galls. And then we're going to do a review at the end on a kind of uh, visualization to kind of do a review so that you um, can ask questions and feel free to ask questions along the way at any point. Um, I love questions. It gets the dialogue going. So feel free to ask. And all I'd ask is uh, for Vincent or Julia to just, uh, once I get talking and anybody who knows me, la la la, I could do this for three hours. So Somebody will have to cut me off by about uh, 120, 125, so that we make sure we have plenty of time for the rest of the discussions today, okay? Cool. Right. So I'm gonna switch my video to my press that is next to me so that you guys can see what we're about to do. Alrighty, yay, good, it worked. 
Okay, so as you might know, you start off with your press. So this is my press. Um, I've had this thing for like 30 years, I think now, um, and it is still strong and doing me quite well. Um, you can also, uh, presses can be in many different forms. You don't have to have a professional press. Um, I actually started off with just a big book. So I had a big gigantic book and that's what I used for years and years and that works just fine. Um, plyboard works really well, uh, lots of things. The cardboard, I just cut it from anything I get and, um, and make it in part of my press. So I'm gonna open up my press because the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start pressing. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take off my big stack here and get to my bottom of my press. And here I am at the base. And whenever I go and collect, I usually go and I collect one area and I really think about how I'm gonna build my press. Often, if I'm gonna do a big day, I'll bring two presses, one for some really difficult specimens and then other ones that are gonna dry really quickly. All these specimens are gonna dry at a different rate, right? And so you will start to think about how they actually need to dry and who needs to come out first and who will take more days. So my jo running joke is, Lots of people ask me about conifers. How do you press conifers? And here's the first deal is one of the reasons I'm also giving this, this uh, lecture today is I also want to encourage people to collect. So I, I don't remember the last time I got a conifer uh, collected in my collection. And so I really want to encourage people to start collecting conifers. They're incredibly cool. And I really need the green bits. I really need this DNA that's in here to last. So I have a lot of old conifers, but I want some new stuff. When you go out and collect a conifer, some of the things that people forget about are things like all the different reproductive parts. So I'm gonna kind of bring this up and I'm gonna show you, here's a female cone from last year. Here's some male cones that are still developing and pollinating. And here is the first uh, little immature female cone just starting that'll be mature next year. And then here is the one that got pollinated this year that'll also be ready. So, Conifers take about a year and a half to actually do their whole reproduction. And the cool thing with the piece I got is I have almost a year and a half of discovery here, a year and a half of reproduction. And that's really what we wanna show is as much reproduction as we can. And so right off the top, I'm gonna to tell you this cone, this big female cone is not going to press, okay? These hard cones, they're woody, they're not gonna press well. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop it off and I'm gonna put it in my cone box. Right, so I'm going to associate my cones to this specimen and I'm gonna tag it as such. And so this is gonna be in a separate cabinet with all my cones. And then this is gonna be laying flat in my cabinet and these will be connected within my database, right? So we always say, know that they're connected, but the cones are not gonna press flat. So I encourage you to please pop those cones off. They're gonna just misbehave. Um, and then what you're gonna do is, this is kind of my running joke with conifers. So, once you got a conifer, you're gonna smack it in the bottom. It's just gonna go in the bottom, okay? Why? Because you're not gonna see it for another five days. You don't wanna look at it, you don't wanna talk to it. It's gonna fight you the whole way. Um, this is a very woody species that is used to high winds, lots of environment, and you're nothing compared to what it can handle. So I'm putting my piece of paper here, I've got my cardboard. I now have my, my plain newsprint. And this is plain newsprint. So this is one of the things we're gonna talk about is Georgia Strait used to be really great for pressing plants. It was the, actually the perfect size of a plant press, but they now staple it and it's got a lot of color in it. So it's a little difficult to actually find paper that's actually really good, but you do want this size, which is 18 by 11. And this is the size of a bearing print. So that way you really use the whole space, right? So I'm gonna use this uh, un, uh, printed newsprint that I buy from the herbarium company. And I'm going to stretch this thing out. I'm going to tell it what to do. And this is often what I do in the field is I just lay it out and I just make it do what I want, right? And I'm going to force it. I've got this green cone here, still this one that was just pollinated this year. I can decide to pop that off or try to make it lay flat. I'm going to see if I can keep it back during this pressing process. And then I've got my little, little non-pollinated female cone right in there. I'm gonna open her up and it's really hard to see sometimes, but I'm gonna open it up there so you can see that. And here's the deal. I'm just gonna close it because like I said, this plant, any conifers, they're gonna fight you. And all I'm gonna do is just cram them in and then I'm just gonna lay on it. So I will put all my weight on this thing 
and I just press and press and press. And you can just tell it's super wobbly, right? So that's the bottom of my press. Why? Because this is going to take the longest to dry. I don't want to look at it because it's not going to behave. And so I'm just going to let that sit in there for about three days until it's going to let me manipulate it. Now, what does that mean manipulate? It means I need the cells to relax, right? I need them to be crushed and I need them to relax. And this is gonna take a while for this to relax. So I'm just gonna put it at the bottom of my press, knowing it's gonna take a while to dry, knowing that the cells are not gonna relax in the way I need. And so I have this off balance already at the very beginning of my press. But one of the things I can do is I can put a little piece of foam in here like this, and it'll help balance it and crush it, right? So now I've got a nice flat surface to start working on my other specimens that I'm collecting in the field. So my next layer, again, I'm gonna take my sheet and this one, I'm gonna show you these details. So this one, I've actually written at the bottom, Achillea millifolum, very terribly written, BDM green roof, because we have a green roof here. And so I collected it this morning from our green roof on July 7th, 2021. And this is my collection number, LJ01. So I'm going to find my LJ01 here. Except I wrote 02. Bad, Linda. So I need to correct that right away so my record stays straight when I go to do my action. So this is actually L1. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to press L1 in here. Linda, uh, may we ask you a question? Uh, we've got a great question from Andre saying, uh, pressing like this, would you do this right in the field or would you bag it and then do it once you return to the home or to the lab? So it depends on your conditions. Um, one time we did a BBM 4A and we were uh, collecting at high elevation and um, all of a sudden a storm came in. So we were trying to press in the field on the back of uh, the truck and um, a storm came in with a thunderstorm. So we ended up having to bag most of the rest of the stuff and then do it back in the hotel or the camp. Um, it also depends on what you're doing. So this conifer, you can cut it and probably sit it in a bag for like three days and not worry about pressing it. But something really delicate, something um, uh, candy flower, something that's really, especially in the spring, a lot of those spring flowers, they're really delicate and you're really going to want to press them immediately. Another one that we're going to show you an example of is Indian paintbrush. This is one that you want to do right away because it's actually parasitic. And because it's parasitic, it will actually start to decompose quite quickly as soon as you pick it. So it's something you want to press. And this is something you'll learn over time is as you start to press things, you'll start to see who needs to be pressed right away and who can actually handle being in that Ziploc bag for a little while. I will suggest if you do the Ziploc bag, blow a little bit of air in the Ziploc bag and put a wet paper towel inside of there to keep the humidity going and also so that it doesn't crush in your backpack or whatever you're carrying it in. So a little paper towel in there that's wet and blow a little bit of air in there so you can have a nice balloon to keep it nice and protected as you go back to your site to actually press the plants, right? Is that good? Yes, uh, thanks so much, Linda. Cool. So I corrected my, my terrible little, uh, my, my little writing there. And so here again, I've got Achillea. This has lots of little flowers, which is great, but I'm gonna just try to separate them out. And one of the things um, I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get this to press flat and also show the basil. I also did grab some of the root, which I wanted to show you. Let's see, okay. I'm going to press this and I'll show you this. So we put it in here and again, I just take another piece of cardboard and I just lean on it. And I'm just, I want to get down. I want to get to the things that's happening, right? And I'm going to do that because I'm Oh, sorry, Linda, the angle you're at right now, we can't hear you. Oh, yeah, just because I'm we can crushing hear you too now. much. So I'm crushing. And I want to have that crush, right? And tomorrow I'll open it up and I'll play with the specimen to make it a better specimen um, because I want those cells to relax so that I can manipulate it better. One of the things people ask me about is dirt. So what do you do when you pick something out and you have a lot of dirt at the bottom, right? So when you're in the field, you can shake it out, but also I have this tool called a hori. It's a great digging tool. It's a hori hori. You can get it at Lee Valley. And it's one of the best gifts I ever had for Mother's Day. 
and you just start tapping the base. You can also flick it with your fingers. I do this all the time. And you just try to get as much of that dirt off as you can, right? So dirt's really bad for a collection. Um, it does some detriment. There's a lot of insects that can hide out in dirt and there's a lot of uh, moisture that can hide out in dirt. Also, we can't ship it across uh, international boundaries when you have dirt. So we really try to get a lot of that dirt off and just shake it off as much as you can. Flick it if you need to, and then it can go into your press, right? So I can put it with this neighbor here, this little friend. And you can already see they're starting to flatten. And now I'm gonna have nice three pieces. And again, lots of flowers, lots of material. Uh, when I first started pressing, everybody does this. The two things people do is they take just the little top of the flower because you feel bad because you don't wanna kill the whole plant. But we often need the whole plant. We often do need these basil um, leaves and we need the root, right? But as we wanna make sure, make sure you know what you're collecting. You don't wanna go killing something that's rare. You don't wanna go picking something when there's not enough around, right? We want this biodiversity to last and document, but we do have to be cautious about how much we collect and that we know what we're collecting. So again, I'm just pushing down. I'm gonna make those relax. The next part is another dirty one. So <laughs> here's some grass. <laughs> and again, I got this out of the, 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 the beady green roof, right? And, um, and this is a lot of dirt, right? So I picked it out, but the whole thing just came out, right? And it's got a lot of associated species in here. But what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm just going to tear it apart. I'm just going to make it do what I want. This is a dirty job but somebody's got to do it. And I just try to get that dirt off. What we really want to do is we want to see those roots, right? We really want to see those clean roots because we need to see if this is an annual, a perennial, a biennial. We need to see whether it's rhizominous or if it's tap rooted. That tells us a lot about the plant. And so again, here I am, I'm taking it apart, just cleaning up as much dirt. It's all, a lot of times the dirt's easy to flick off once it's dry. This is quite wet. So I'm having trouble getting all the dirt off, right? And uh, we actually have a question about removing dirt. Yeah. Um, so Julia mentions you could use water in a spray bottle, but Sonia asks, could you remove some of the dirt with uh, by dipping in alcohol? Um, so alcohol actually degrades DNA. So as much as you want to use alcohol for certain purposes, it actually can degrade the DNA. It really dries it out, right? Um, which is exactly why we're using it on our hands all the time right now due to this wonderful coronavirus. So, um, or COVID virus. So um, you don't want to use alcohol, but definitely you can use a spray bottle or you can do it under a tap. So this plant that I'm going to bring up next, I'm going to show you, I probably will have to put it through a tap of water. So let me press this first grass. And look, the grass is too long, right? Now this, I know this is my sheet size right here. So all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make a V, right? So anytime you have something too long, just make it into a V or you can make it into a W or any of those shapes where you just bend it. And that way now, let me get the pine out of there. I now have my grass, I now have the inflorescence, I now have the root. I now have leaf structure. So now I have a nice specimen that somebody can actually utilize for science, right? And I'm gonna angle it so I get the, leaf, the most amount of plant material I can. Most people don't realize, but these sheets are this big so that you can cover them with as much material as possible. And you can make multiple sheets. So you can even have vegetative and reproductive on two different sheets if you need more space. And again, you just do this layering and we crush it, right? So there we go. So the next thing is if I have a specimen like this, but specifically I went and I got this Junkus. Junkus loves water and it notoriously holds on to a lot of dirt. This is one of those cases that I would probably hold onto this, put it in a Ziploc bag and take it home and start to rinse it into some sort of um, flowing water so that I can really try to tease this apart because I still wanna see everything that's underneath here, right? I need to see how this is actually growing. So I would definitely put this under water, but my, my one thing to warn you is once you add water to this, 
you really need to think about drying it really well. Um, the whole point behind what you're doing is you're exiccating out the water. So you're trying to convince an herbarium specimen to dry out. And if you add water to here, it means that when you go to dry it, there's going to be more water down here than the rest of the plant. And that means that often it will mold down here, down to this root structure if you've been using water. So make sure to dry it with a towel or paper towel. And then even when you go to press it, um, put it with a paper towel, possibly at the base to really absorb that water. And like I'm going to keep telling you over and over today is change your paper. This is a major thing people don't do is they don't change their paper out. And that's actually where you get most of the molding issues is changing out your paper. So every two to three days, again, depending on how wet the material is, how fragile it is, you're going to want to change that paper out, which means you do have to move the information that you're doing. But you really, um, you really want to make sure that you you document, but change out that paper. That's what's going to end up really hurting these plants in the long run and molding out. Linda. Yes. Um, just letting you know, it is 122. And oh. um, unfortunately, the camera's gotten a little unfocused. So would you be able to quickly put something uh, to the camera just to kind of refocus it? That'd be perfect. Thanks. <laughs> Does that work? Uh, it seems to. OK, cool, cool. So as I say, time goes by fast. The one thing I do, and I don't know if I, I might show you in a different way when we do, let me see. I wanna show you the side of my press. Do you see how off shoot that conifer is making? So I want you to know that if you ever have a situation where you have this imbalance going on, you can often just take the press stuff and turn it, right? So if you think about it, a lot of people will press in the same direction. So you'll have your rooted materials down here and you'll keep stacking and so all your rooted materials in one corner but what happens is it offsets the whole press so if you just keep turning some of these and have the root here and have the root here it will actually start to balance the press so not only the foam helps balance it but actually being able to turn the specimens themselves and have the big bulky parts in different parts of the press actually helps it to get it more flat in the long run okay and then before i pass you on to julia here, and we can show you that again, but here is, there's certain things that are going to fall apart. So you know, here I've got this wonderful hardened wooden cone, and that's going to stay together, and I can put that in a box. But ABs, which are true furs, they fall apart, and there's nothing you can do about it. Same with hemlock needles. They just fall off. So this is something to notice. It's not anything you're doing. It's just the plant is actually doing what it's supposed to do, which is fall apart and have all those reproductive parts fall away and actually disperse. So this is what we have to do with ABs is we have to actually just put it in a Ziploc bag and that's the specimen because we know it's gonna fall apart, right? So we'll review that a little bit more, but I wanna make sure I give Julia time to do her demonstration as well for her plant. So I will pass it now off on to Julia. Thanks, Linda. Awesome. Thanks, Linda. Um, so I'm an instructor at UCIT and we get our students to do plant collections as part of our, um, our schoolwork where we learn about how to identify plants. So uh, that's sort of my perspective on it and, and experience with it is, is um, collecting plants and pressing them for these types of plant collections. So we get a lot of different issues and, and problems that happen, common issues like Linda was talking about with the conifers. So I'm gonna focus on a couple other things today. I have some uh, different plants with galls on them. So galls, G-A-L-L-S, are um, uh, usually from insects that are attacking the plant and then the plant kind of has this growth response that changes the way the plant looks. So that's one of the things I'm gonna show you. And um, I also have some fruit we're gonna press and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, how to press things so that they um, are, are, the leaves are showing properly. So I'm gonna switch over to my other camera here, I think. Oh. No. Technical difficulties. <laughs> uh oh. Well, I think I've lost my camera, which is unfortunate. Um well, let me see if I can get my assistant here. <laughs> Maybe I can just help. Oh, wait, hold on. Are you trying to use your iPad, Julia? Yeah, I'm trying to turn the video on on it. It won't turn on for some reason. Okay, um, I've said ask to start video, see if that works. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe it's locked me out. We tested it earlier. Hmm. Well, let me try um, the like discount version. <laughs> well, if there was a will, there's a way, right? When it comes to technology. Okay. So I will just see if I can get this out of the way here. Oh. So I don't have my fancy press with me. I just have a, a book. So Linda was talking about how pressing things in a book can work really well. And so that this book here actually is my very first plant press as like a kid. So <laughs> it still smells like uh, the flowers that I pressed when I was a kid. And, and it's an old dictionary and it's kind of this wonderful sort of um, um, older school paper. So I'm just, can, can you see okay if I'm like this? Uh, yeah, it looks fine for my end. Okay, great. So let's, um, Linda and I were talking about how pressing plants is kind of like a cooking show. So <laughs> you can bring out the unpressed specimens and then you can bring out the pressed ones and kind of do a comparison and talk a little bit about it. So here's one of the plants that I collected uh, earlier today. So this is a willow that has galls on it. Uh, can you see the, um, the bumps on the leaves? Um, I think the camera's aimed oh, too oh, high, too yeah. Too high, is that better? That's better, yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's these little bumps on the leaves from where the insects are. And usually we get this kind of tendency that we want to collect perfect plant specimens, right? We want to collect these ones that don't have any damage on them or don't have any um, you know, insect bites or insect galls. And really, like Linda was talking about, it's really great to have diversity in a collection. So we want to have diversity of, of plants we want to have um, diversity of, of different insects. Oh, it looks like maybe my camera is going to work. <laughs> oh, I have my assistant helping me here. Okay, is this one? No, anyways, we're, we're, we're moving on here. So we have, um, uh, like I said, a diversity of, of reasons why we might wanna collect plants. And one of them is to have these uh, a record of insect insects that attack plants as well. So this is the unpressed specimen, and you can see it's it's fairly uh, big, kind of bulky, lots of leaves. So if I tried to press this plant, it would um, it wouldn't press great because you would have all this overlapping leaves. So what we want to do for a specimen like this is to actually first put it into the press, which in this case uh, here is my book and let the cells relax a little bit. So this is what it looks like after it's relaxed for about an hour or two. Some, some plants will relax quicker and others won't. Uh, same like Linda was talking about with the conifers that take a long time to relax. So for here, now we can see that again, I have some uh, leaves that are overlapping or leaves that are um, you know, bent. So what we can try to do is pick off some of the ones that are kind of not not really adding to the specimen so we can get rid of some of those and so that can help us have a clearer specimen we can also try to flip back around leaves that have been flipped the wrong way so again with flowers that's really helpful to try to get the flowers spread out and open so i'm just picking off a few of them here and once we've done that, we'll have a much nicer looking specimen. So you can see already that makes that a lot easier to sort of interpret and look at than, than, the, uh, than say this one, <laughs> the unpressed version. So if I let this press and dry for a few days, I'll get something like this. So this is a different willow with other types of galls on it. So I've got some little kind of red galls over here and here. And again, I was amazed when I went out in the forest and looked at just how many different types of galls there were. So I hadn't ever really gone out to collect specifically for this purpose. So I was amazed at how many different kinds I was able to find. So um, yeah, so this is the one where I've gone in and I've adjusted and, and taken out a bunch of the leaves and tried to make sure that it was nice and flat. So I've pressed it uh, for a couple of days now. 
So um, I have another specimen here with some interesting galls. And this one is again, another different willow species. And you can see the galls are quite large on it and rather thick. So the, I'd say one of the more important things about trying to press these is again, not, not trying to crush them too hard. If you have a plant press like Linda's um, where you have straps or if you have bolts, you just don't wanna press these so hard that they smash. So for me with my book, it's not too much of a problem. I can just kind of lightly crush it and it should be okay. So if I flip again with like Linda did, it's good to start kind of at the back of your book and crush from this direction. So I'm gonna let the cells relax on this one and then I'll come back in and, and remove some of the plant leaves at a later time. I also found this really cool galls on the Saskatoon plants. And so they kind of look like, um, I don't know, they're really interesting. They're sort of like little half circle waves. <laughs> oh, there we go. Now you can see it a little bit better. You see how cool they are? <laughs> I was blown away and they're like this really interesting kind of reddish color too. So um, the Saskatoon seems to have a couple different kinds of, of galls on it. It also has this like fuzzy one uh, in it too. So I thought this was a really cool specimen to, to press. And I've got one here, uh, I got a Saskatoon here with a couple berries on it. So again, depending on what time of year you're collecting at, you'll be collecting different features. Like ideally in a collection, you might want to have um, a flower and a fruit. You might want to have a completely healthy specimen. You might want to have one with galls on it. You might want to try and collect at um, in the fall when the leaves are starting to change color or early in the spring when the leaves are first starting to come out. So one of the things that's great about plant pressing is that you can do it kind of any time of the year. You can even press um, twigs and stuff like that. So for this one, uh, I'm, I'm going to be pressing these berries, which again, uh, can be a little bit problematic because you might get some juice coming out. So I'm going to put some paper around these just to make sure that I get some extra coverage when I, when I press it. And again, the other thing that I found problematic with berries is that they sometimes stick to the page. So they stick to the back of the, of the page. So again, it's kind of just good to go in and check on your plants a few times while they're drying and not just let it stay in there for the whole time. Um, yeah, so little berries like this are a lot easier to press. Uh, something big like, a, you know, like a, an apple sized uh, fruit, you might need to cut it in half in order to press it properly. Ideally, you want to be able to see some of the seeds or be able to extract that information um, at a later date. So I'm just going to, again, put it in here cover it up and I'll have to come and check on it in a little bit. And so I'm just gonna do kind of similar style to Linda here. And I'm just gonna try and crush it a little bit. <laughs> so I'm hoping that that uh, is going to suffice on that. So again, in the magic of, of the plant press world, I have another specimen here that I did a couple days ago that is dry. So again, this one has another small berry sort of similar to the Saskatoon. This is called a, a Supalali or a soap berry. And it's got great little uh, berries on it. Again, they're not too liquidy, so they pressed and dried really easily. And you can see the seed through it on this one. So you can actually see the, the seed. So that's a good, good indicator there. Um, what some of the common issues I've seen with pressing berries is that um, people don't change the paper out. So then it doesn't uh, dry properly. And again, the berries will get moldy. So sometimes you'll want to make sure that you've changed the paper a few times and, and uh, you know, don't let your specimens get molding on you. That's probably the most critical thing with the berries. I don't know if you'd like to add anything on that, Linda, about berry pressing before we go to the mural board. Yeah, so for berries, um, <clears throat> Often, uh, like like Julie was saying, so often we would need to see the inside. So we'll ask you to possibly crush that berry. And if you're ever wondering whether or not, like kind of what to collect, I often look on the floor and kind of see what you need to key something. So if, it, if I need to know how many seeds are inside, then I know I'm gonna need to cut that open. 
And even when Julie was talking about, if you actually have to, people ask me this, like, what if you had to preserve an apple? Well, it's not gonna preserve really well, right? But what you do is you make slices. And what we really are trying to see is that inside. So that hardened part that you don't eat, that that's the, that's the carpels. And we wanna be able to see what's inside there, the ovaries and see how many are there and how many seeds. So that's where we'd be cutting and then drying that and possibly getting rid of the outside parts unless we were trying to um, look at the, the, the coloring of the apple, right? Which we probably took a picture of. The other thing you can also do is take wax paper. You can take wax paper or parchment paper and you can put it on both sides of the berry. I also use this when I do salal. So salal's um, flowers are really, really sticky and those often also attach to the paper. So often when I do salal, I'll just put wrap it around with parchment paper and it'll still dry pretty well and I'll keep it there until it's not sticky and gross anymore. And so that really helps as well with those fruits. Thanks, Linda. We also have a few questions from some of our uh, viewers. Uh, so one is, if a specimen does start to mold while drying, can you fix it or do you have to start over? So it, it does depend. So um, once the mold starts, so mold's pretty tricky. The funniest thing once I work in the collections is what I never realized is that molds attack mold. So fungi attacks fungi. Um, and so that's even more complicated. But um, you can, so fungi, so one of the things we're going to talk about, but you need to freeze your specimens right away. Also, once they're dry, not until they're dry, do you freeze them for about a week to help with these kind of things like mold and insects. But mold likes the freezer. It's not great in a freezer. It actually tends to need to be superheated. And a lot of people don't have that. So once it starts, often what I would do is just pick the berries off that are molding um, and try to save the rest of the specimen because you're going to really be fighting that mold. Um, and it'll just start to attack the paper, it'll start to attack the collection. So if mold shows up in a collection here, I often just start picking off the pieces and I'll put them maybe in a plastic bag, uh, but I'll keep them separated from my collection. All right, thanks, Linda. Do you have time for a few more questions? Sure. Yeah, uh, so when using, let's say, wax paper for the berries, um, do they need to be changed as well? And will it actually dry while wrapped in the wax paper? It will dry. I've always been really surprised. It dries quite well. Now don't do the whole thing. Just do where the berries are, right? So just a little bit of wax paper around the berries. It dries really well. Um, and I would, again, check it. Just make sure it's not totally sticking to that. Make sure that you'll be able to peel it off and put it onto the sheet itself. Um, but you should have pretty good success with it drying. And then you can squish it uh, if, you, if it's one of those that needs to be squished so we can see what's inside. Thanks, Enda. And so when how often would you recommend switching the paper when pressing berries? So yeah, I would do it again, it depends. So if you're doing it in the spring, spring's a lot more wet. A lot of those plants that you're collecting are very thin um, and very fragile. Uh, and so I would be switching the paper every two days. Like when I do skunk cabbage, uh, I have to switch that paper out almost every day for a couple of days because the base is so thick and so wet that I have to constantly change that paper out. I use blotter paper as well. So it's, it's about a dollar a sheet and I did invest in that and that helps a lot with those wet plants. But if you're in the dry Okanagan and you're collecting, it's amazing. You can, you can go like days without checking your paper, right? Um, unless you're doing a cactus, which I didn't do today because cactus are a whole nother ball game. Thanks, Linda. Um, and yes, uh, you mentioned you were using herbarium paper. Where would one get that? Uh, so I have, you know, I don't know if we're allowed to tout off, but I have a great guy named Cap. Uh, he's at the Herbarium Supply Company and he is the best. He's in Montana. He only leaves when there's trout season, uh, but otherwise he's, uh, if he's not fishing, then he's working and uh, the supplies are there also here. So I have all the supplies here. I heavily encourage people to press plants. I even sell plant presses. I sell the paper. I sell the tape. I sell the glue. I'll make a kit for you and you can come pick it up. Um, but I love people pressing and I have all the supplies. So it's pretty easy for me to pass along. Thanks, Linda. And yes, please, please uh, tell us what you have available. Um, excited to see people enthused about that. So yes, thank you. Uh, no more questions at the moment. Okay, so we're going to share our screen. And where am I? Haha. -ha. So we're going to share this board and me and Julie have been working on this board to kind of 
overview what we've been talking about. And this is something that we can probably capture a PDF and put it online as well. So you can kind of look at it since I know that we're probably gonna shoot through this pretty quickly. But let me put it in presenter mode. And where I'm gonna start off with is I'm going to try to not make anybody dizzy while I do this. And we're gonna zoom into conifers. So right here, I have my conifer section. And these are just little reminders. So needles will fall off many species. So hemlock, they fall off. There's nothing you can do about it unless you shellac it. And if you shellac it, it's no good for science. So on the left-hand side is an excellent example of a hemlock and all the needles are gone. So let me see if I can zoom in. And just by the way, this is from our founder, um, John Davidson. So this one right here on the left-hand side, it's perfect. Needles are all gone, but they're in that little tiny packet right here. And then it has the cones and these cones you actually can press because they're so nice and tiny. So it has reproductive parts, it has information, plus it has the needles in the packet. And this was a common issue as you see here that Julia brought up uh, where all the needles fall off a hemlock, it's totally okay. This is another question that did come up and I want everybody to know this is exactly how I started pressing plants, but don't use photo albums. So this was used in a photo album. It's exactly how I started as well. All of my pressings were in a photo album because they have a nice little cover, but none of it's archival. And so it's acidic and it'll start to um, react to your specimens and it'll start to degrade them really quickly. So um, do come and get archival material from me if you want, uh, if you really want to start pressing those specimens. The other thing, like I was telling you is um, ABs. You're going to just put those little cones in a bag. Uh, they're not going to stay together um, and no worries they're going to fall apart that's what they're supposed to do so you can also again keep them in a large container like i said and um, and they're going to lose their color conifers really struggle to keep their color um, it's just not something they do so no worries that they go brown it's okay Cedars stay really nice and green and i will tell you i press cedar every year and then i take a little uh, snippets of it and then I make them into Christmas cards because they make really nice Christmas trees on Christmas cards. So that's how I use them in my extra pressings that don't work out. One of the other things we wanted to talk about was roots and bulbs. So be mind, so you want to clean the roots. I talked a little bit about that. I wanted to bring up ferns because often ferns are deep in the ground and you need to clean those fern bases as well. But we really need the base of a fern to be able to uh, describe it properly and utilize it. So you will again have to clean off a lot of that dirt that is uh, on the specimen and it'll be really bulky. So you're gonna have the same problem like you do with grasses. Here's a beautiful, beautiful example of nice clean roots. It was bent so that these reproductive parts are easy to see. This is a gorgeous specimen from Bruce Bennett up in the Yukon, he collects for us. Has his own herbarium called Baby because it's the smallest herbarium in North America. And then bulbs, so I had no bulbs to show you guys, it's not the season. So I did want to show you this amazing example from Gerald Straley, um, who was our original director. And here's a gorgeous specimen. So if you ever want to know what you're supposed to do with a bulb, this is what you do is you cut it in half. You can now see the inside, you can see its layers, and then you can also see the outside, right? So he actually saved the outside casing. And then he spread everything out really nicely so you could really utilize this specimen and see all the bits. Right, so Gerald Straley, if you ever look up in our collection, they're all imaged um, and you can see these beautiful specimens of Gerald Straley's. I often go to him if I'm trying to figure out what to do. The one thing I do wanna say is be mindful when you're collecting bulbs and you're collecting roots, you are killing the plant. So make sure there's plenty of specimens around uh, in that area. Make sure you're not collecting something rare uh, when you're gonna go and collect those roots. And then keeping it flat, so lots of, lots of little um, suggestions here. So you're gonna crush your plant first, like I say, and me and Julia crush it. You need those cells to relax. You're gonna manipulate it maybe in a few hours later in the day or the next day. And then you're going to take off extra leaves that aren't gonna get in the way. Or um, if you have way too many flowers and they're all clustered on each other, you might wanna take some of those off. Like if you were gonna do yucca, it has a tremendous amount of flowers and they will mold if you don't start to remove some of those. You also want constant pressure, consistent pressure. So every day you might pull your straps a little tighter, right? And then pull things out that are already dry and just keep it going, right? I wanted to show you a picture of my setup at home. So my drying station is a fan. 
a heater and my press. And so I put the fan on with the heater and my press, and then I got to turn my press every couple of days to make sure everything's drying properly. Here is an example of overlapping. So we have too many overlapping twigs. We can't really see what's going on in here. Here we have a Linda. beautiful, yes. Actually, on the topic of the heater, uh, we have a question from Kai saying, is it possible to use a food dehydrator on the lowest setting to pre-dry moist plants? You could, just be cautious, right? So um, the degrees that I look for when I'm drying a plant for that consistency is about 25 degrees Celsius, right? So just make sure you're keeping it low. The other thing is, I hopefully your heater is big because you want to put the whole specimen in. If you're just going to do the root, it could start to dry at a different rate. And so it could start to warp things. And that's often why I want to make sure you guys are clear is that the warping happens, which is right here. So this warping will occur if it's not consistently dry. So if you start to dry it and then it's not totally dry and you allow water to get reabsorbed through humidity, so let's say you're, you turn the dryer off too quick, it will start to reabsorb the water in the atmosphere and it'll warp it and it'll start to get um, really wavy. So your leaves will be really wavy. Um, so that's how you avoid that. That is one of the common things that almost everybody does, including myself still every once in a while. I just get these bad specimens and they crumple up because I didn't have them dry all the way, right? And you can actually see here too, this beautiful specimen in the center. It's gorgeous. It's a, it's a beautiful delphinium, I think, but every single leaf is covered up that I actually cannot see the shape of any of these leaves really clearly other than this little one that I can't see all the way. So this is where you need to, you need to be smart. You're, you're going to remove stuff so that you can see this specimen clearly, right? So that it can really be um, something useful for science and yourself later. Um, last thing is you may need to adjust where your specimens are in the press. So like I said, you can turn your specimens around. If there's a lot of roots on one side, just move some over to the other and you can start to balance that. You can use the foam for the imbalances. And obviously the goal is everything needs to be flat by the end because it's gonna go in a collection and be used for science for the next 550 to 600 years. And like I say, there are three, five, seven, ten 10 days stride just depending on the thickness, right? So now I wanna give Julia some time here because we're already running out of time. So I'm gonna get back to full screen, I hope. Oh, sorry, there we go. Yeah, no, this has been great, Linda. And I think we've been addressing the questions along the way. So um, I don't think we necessarily need to stop and have a Q&A. But uh, maybe let's uh, zoom back in on the berries. Um, so uh, we talked a little bit about a few of these things about the berries getting stuck to the paper. Um, another thing that I don't think we mentioned specifically with the berries, but you showed it with the, the conifer cone, Linda, was using foam to kind of help support thick berries or, or um, uneven press when you're pressing. So it depends, again, a lot on the plant and what you're pressing. But again, the key is to make sure to squish it. <laughs> Just go ahead and squish it as good as you can. Try to get some of the seeds to be visible. Um, make sure you're checking on it regularly so that it is drying properly. You can use a little bit of wax paper to help it from um, not sticking in your press, but just do the wax paper just around the berries themselves. And some of the bigger berries you may need to cut in half. Uh, I think there was a question in the chat about using a dehydrator to dehydrate berries which I haven't done for collection purposes. Have you, Linda? No, no, because I tend to squish them and um, I just stick with my press. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, me too. So again, I guess it depends on what your objective is with your pressing. So um, like Linda's talking about pressing things to make sure that they're usable into the future. For me, with my students, we're pressing things to make sure that we can identify them. Uh, for our projects. You might want to just press plants to make them into pretty wall art. <laughs> so again, it kind of just depends on what your objective is for the pressing itself. Uh, so the galls, I really encourage you to go out there and press some galls. Again, it's kind of a, a weird uh, thing because you think that the, the, the plant is, is not healthy, therefore you shouldn't press it. But it's really good to get that diversity in your collection to represent what a plant can look like when it's healthy, what a plant can look like when it has different kinds of problems. 
Um, and you don't want to crush the galls too hard or they can, um, they can bust open and, and squish. And they're just the, often they're the little homes for where the insects are. For the ones I showed you today were all leaf galls, but you can get them on stems. Uh, you can get them on roots. You can get them um, in trunks of trees. <laughs> Obviously, you're not going to press those, but you can get galls and burls and, and plant reactions happening in all different kinds of the plant. So keep your eye out. If you see weird looking um, growths on a plant, it, it could be a gall. So there's lots of really interesting ones out there. I was I amazed will, at how many I could yeah. find. And I will say, Julia, like I'm, especially with all the global climate change, a lot of people should know that we're utilizing these specimens to really watch movement. And so collecting of these goals mm. and weird things, um, it's also, they'll change the morphology. So we actually do need people to start collecting it plants that have been infected basically by these galls because they look different and we need to have examples of all these different morphologies that are coming about because of these galls. So it's super great that you're covering this, Julia. Yeah, I'm, I'm all stoked on galls now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, so we touched a little bit on this, both Linda and I, but um, keeping the color you want to make sure, again, you're drying your plants quickly, but at a moderate temperature. So again, checking on them regularly, using good paper. Uh, sometimes you can, if you don't want to buy the expensive blotting paper, you can use paper towel as well. Uh, you can use a heater and a fan, but make sure to turn your press so that it's drying evenly. Uh, sometimes you want to try to press something at a different time of the year. So the fall color, you might want to get a specimen that has different um, colors. So you're, you're kind of capturing what it looks like at different times of the year. However, we ideally want to have green specimens so that, that then the DNA can be extracted uh, for purposes um, in, in the future and for research as well. But there are certain plants that just always seem to lose their color. Uh, certain parasitic plants are really bad for that. Um, and things like uh, red elderberry is really bad for it, um, skunk cabbage. So some plants just seem to uh, be quite wet and are hard to keep the color. Other ones, I don't know, I've, you know, like things like um, a foxglove and certain flowers, just they always, always turn color. So don't beat yourself up. Uh, some, some plants just change color and there's not much you can do about it but making sure that you have good paper, consistent drawing and uh, checking them regularly and make and switching out the paper should, should help um, give you the best color you can. So um, the last thing is maybe just to mention the resources, Linda, and then there's a couple questions in the chat we can probably grab before we wrap up. So we listed some extra resources. There's so many nowadays. We're all so lucky. Um, <laughs> there's so many online. There's so many resources, but there is these apps, Seek, iNaturalist, Vancouver Trees, and PlantSnap. And then it's a little hard to read our websites, um, but E4BC also has a tremendous list of tons of resources if you're trying to identify vascular plants in the Pacific Northwest. The Burke Herbarium has tons of online resources as well. BC Systems and Ecosystems, that's the Conservation Data Center of BC. So they're the ones who are tracking all plants across BC. So they have a tremendous website. Q Plants of the World, if you're really into the world and all these different invasives that are here, Q Plants tracks those. And Buds, Branches, and Barks, a guide to the winter ID of Pacific Northwest. And then we also have a few pictures of some of our books that we often use. Everybody knows Poor Joe McKinnon. If you don't, grab it. It's about 30, 35 bucks. It's worth it. You'll have it for the rest of your life. I've got five. Yeah. <laughs> um, Wildflowers of the Pacific Northwest is a really nice introduction. It actually is based on flower color. And so it can be really helpful for those being introduced to identification. If you're really hardcore, the floor of the Pacific Northwest is, has a second edition, has just come out this past year during the pandemic. So you might not have known that it has been updated after the 60 years. So it's a tremendous book that is being updated online as well. Floor of North America, also things like specialized books. If you're really into the, the pond weeds, which we didn't go over, but pond weeds are huge. And so there's actually specialized books that you can buy for identification of these really crazy weeds that you find in ponds and other things. 
And um, again, you have Pojar McKinnons uh, for all over BC uh, in the dry areas. Um, trees, of course, trees are huge. I really wanna encourage people to collect trees and collect conifers and collect shrubs. As much as we love all of our pretty little flowers, we're forgetting that there's these amazing trees and shrubs around them that we need to collect as well and document because this weather's getting pretty rough for some of these big trees and um, we need to start detecting what's happening and whether or not their habitat is um, going to be available in the future. Was there yeah. anything else, Julia, on the re re extra resources? Uh, no, I think that's great. And I hope the, the chat, uh, the link worked for people. I, and I think I saw a few people have logged into the board. Uh, there's a couple questions in the chat. One, somebody was asking about taking pictures. I always think that's a great idea and taking them at different scales, um, like a further back, close up. Uh, it's great to have those. And most modern smartphones also um, like geolocate your picture. So then you have a location record too, which is helpful <laughs> in case you forget. Um, and I would heavily encourage if you really are into collecting and you really want feedback, share with your pictures with iNaturalist. There's a lot of botanists who quietly scavenger that site and they'll correct your IDs uh, for free. <laughs> so really good resources. They're quietly doing it. And, um, and I would really start suggesting people to, to, to take their pictures and put them on iNaturalist more and more. Thanks, Linda. We have a few more questions if you have time. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> I could be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so from Sonia, uh, once you've pressed and have the, uh, uh, the presses ready for storage, um, what would be a good way to store it? Let's say like in a plastic box, would you put like paper between? Yeah, so a lot of people do just get a tote, a plastic tote and put it in a plastic tote and that's fine. But when you're done with your specimens and once they're dry, um, I wanna just grab something. So I've been pressing specimens um, for a project here at the Burke Museum called uh, Fireweed Fields. And I've been doing a pre-collection because we're gonna see if we can increase biodiversity. But when your specimens are dried, I wanna make sure that you realize they're dry when you can hear them. I don't know if you can hear that, but if you can flick them and hear them, you know that they're dry, right? But once that's happened, you need to put this in the freezer. So securely in the freezer, put all your specimens together I wrap them up with two pieces of cardboard on each side and I just string them together like this. And then I put them in a plastic bag and then I put them in my freezer for about two to three weeks. And that's gonna kill most of the bugs, most of the mold, most of the issues that can happen here. I then bring it out of the freezer after those two weeks and I don't take it out of the bag for 24 hours. I want all the moisture to go away so that the plant doesn't reabsorb any of the moisture that's inside that bag. And it's one of the last steps you're gonna to do to ensure that these are gonna last a long time. And by the way, I have to do my whole collection every five years. So they all have to be frozen. This is the only way to keep them going so we don't have to spray them with nasty chemicals like we used to have to do. Our um, collections used to be sprayed with DDT and, um, and then we used to put uh, naphtha ethylene in all of the cabinets. So we're trying to get away from chemicals and this is how we do it, is freezing. So just freeze your collection often and it's fine in the tote to store it, but that's not air secure, but it doesn't need to be. But just also make sure about humidity. You don't wanna keep it in a place that's really dry and you don't wanna keep it in a place that's really moist. So a lot of people think their basement is great. Um, so if you're in a basement apartment, be cautious. It's quite moist in there and they might start reabsorbing water and that might mean you get a bug outbreak. So just refreeze it if you do get a bug outbreak and try to get that under control. Thanks, Linda. Um, another great question is, uh, what are be some good places to start looking for uh, specimens, looking for plants to press? Your backyard. <laughs> backyard biodiversity. I believe in it heavily. Um, I think you just start searching around your backyard. I often tell people, go to edges. Go to edges of anything. Go to the edge of a lawn. Go to the edge of a building. Go to the edge of something. Go to a transition zone. That's often where you're going to find interesting species. Go to the lots all around BC that are empty, right? They have the coolest weeds. Go to cemeteries. Cemeteries have some of the coolest old, old plants around because they're not really weeded heavily. Um, I'm collecting, right now, I'm collecting a lawn that we're having growing out at the Burke Museum for this fireweed field. I've collected 25 species in two weeks 
with something that looked just like a lawn that looked like it maybe had three or four. So really go to those areas, look for unique habitats, look for water. That's the other one, especially this summer, my gosh, look in waterways, uh, look where there's, I always say when their feet are wet, um, we love seepage areas, right? That's often where you're gonna get really interesting combinations of species is where you find these water pockets around, right? So definitely this summer with it being hot already, go look for water pockets as you're cooling off and see if you can find some new cool stuff. Thanks. Uh, Linda, all right, let's see. Any questions we missed? Uh, so a good place to look for specimens. Uh, I think uh, Nicole put in the chat uh, best ways to contact you if they were interested in getting some uh, pressing materials. Oh yeah, uh, a website. Uh, you can go to our website and find me um, and just email me. And uh, now that we're back in town um, and in the building, um, I always have supplies available for anybody who wants to get going. Uh, so I'm Linda Jennings, so just look at me on the BD website. Thanks, Linda. Um, and what kind of supervision or control or freedom would you recommend if elementary school children were being sent out to go collect some specimens? Ooh, that's my favorite. So <laughs> Nicole knows this. So we usually do a pressing workshop at spring break, as we know, Vincent, and it's so fun. And I miss the little ones here because we get to make little presses and they get to go away with their plants. But one of the big things we tell them is, First off, don't eat anything that you find, right? Um, don't put a berry in your mouth uh, just because it looks yummy. And um, again, it's like all of us, even not just kids, but all of us, one in 20. So if you don't see 20 individuals, don't take it, okay? It needs it, right? So that's our one in 20 rule. So if you can count 20 individual plants that are the same, then you can take one of them, right? And that's the responsible way to collect. Also asking permission. So whether it's permission from your neighbor because they have a pretty plant and you really want to make it into a pretty piece of art for your mom or your dad, or if it's um, on crown land or if it's on First Nation land, you want to make sure that you get permission and that you have those permits in place. And especially in a provincial park, you do need to get a permit and it does take six months. So you don't collect in provincial parks. They don't need the pressure. Um, but there's lots of other beautiful places, including your own backyard, including your own street that you can collect and bring them to me. So that's the other thing. Make sure if you're making these collections, I want them. That's the whole point of this, right? So I need everybody collecting and I need people getting me cool specimens that are all around Vancouver and, and all around BC and all around the world. Thanks, Linda. Um... Let's see, I think we've covered most of the other questions here. So yes, uh, in the chat, if you haven't seen, Nicole's posted our, the link to the website and also Linda's email if you're interested in purchasing some uh, supplies for pressing. Um, oh, we had a question on archival newsprint. So you mentioned uh, not to use newsprint, but are there um, like from art supply shops like Desaires or Opus, um, they often have high acid content. Are there any you might recommend? It's been a while since I've gone to the art store. So that is where I started. Um, I often tell people there's there's two other places that you can look. So art stores is one of them where you can look for uh, archival material, archival paper. The other one is also libraries. So often what I'm using also libraries use. So the tape that I use to tape my specimens down is actually library bonding tape. So it's when a uh, book breaks, it's actually the tape they use. So um, McLaren, I think, is an archival company in Canada, and uh, they carry a lot of these supplies as well, um, so you can find those. But I do know it's expensive, so I always want to tell people, the only reason I have this is because I work here. Everything I ever pressed uh, for 20 years was not archival. I didn't have all this gear with me, and I still made beautiful specimens that are deposited here in this university, and that's fine. You don't have to have all the tools, but if you do want them, always email me. I'll give you all the references for those, those, uh, those specialized items. All right, thanks so much, uh, Linda. Uh, thank you, Julia. I think um, that's a lot of questions we've had and some amazing answers. Um, so is there anything else you wanted to share with everyone before we uh, wrap things up today? I just wanna thank everybody for coming out today. This is spectacular. I'm so excited when so many people are excited about pressing plants. And I really hope that you guys come out to the museum. By the way, when it's hot, this is the coolest place to be in town by far. Um, but come bring your specimens, come ask me questions anytime. And I hope to see you in the museum. 
All right, thanks so much, Linda. Thank you, Julia. And of course, thank you to everyone who has joined us for this amazing opportunity. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Um, I learned a few things as well. Um, so uh, those of you who have joined us before for BD at Homes, uh, thank you for um, being there with us. Uh, we do have another one uh, next week. Uh, next week, we actually have fire followers. So the artist who worked on one of our art displays, um, it's actually made from charcoal made from plants in forest fires. So, I mean, always relevant, but particularly relevant. Um, you can actually check that out at our museum, but we'll have at our BDO Home virtual program, we'll be talking with the artists uh, who worked on that. So check that out next week. Um, just like this one, you can register for it online. Uh, so once again, thank you everyone. Thanks for being a part of BD at Home. Um, thank you again to Linda and Julia for leading this amazing program. And to all of our visitors, thanks for joining us for BD at Home at the BD Biodiversity Museum. Thanks so much, everyone.